start our meeting today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening if you are attending from far away in the east. Uh, my name is Dominique Burgeon, and I'm the director of the FAO liaison office in Geneva. And uh, I'm very pleased to be your, your moderator uh, today. It is my pleasure to welcome you uh, ready to what is the seventh session of the FAO in Geneva uh, Social Protection Dialogue Series, uh, a series that is organized in, col in collaboration with the FAO's Rural Transformation and Gender Equality uh, Division. Uh, a special warm welcome to all the colleagues who have joined uh, in person. We have a, a packed room here in, in Geneva uh, today. And uh, for today's session, we are very pleased to collaborate with our dear colleagues from the Office of the High Commissioner uh, for, um, uh, for Human Rights. And I, I would like to thank, I would say, Bo and uh, FAO and OHCHR organizations, social protection and right to food teams uh, for their dedication to making this dialogue possible. This is a uh, premiere, but not a... Uh, uh, we would like, of course, also to express our gratitude to the permanent mission of Brazil for the sponsorship of this event and its commitment, support, and leadership regarding uh, rights-based approaches uh, to food security, nutrition, and social protection. Uh, today's session will examine how social protection functions as a means to the realization of the right to adequate food, to addressing the root causes of hunger and malnutrition in all its forms. It will show how the right-based approach to social protection recognizes the human right to social security and ensures the dignity of the person. Today's event is set within the context of the 20th anniversary. Uh, this year of the adoption of the voluntary guidelines in support okay. of the progressive realization of the right to adequate food, which is a long name, the short name being the right to food uh, guidelines. Finally, I want to highlight that tomorrow, as you all know, we will celebrate the 79th anniversary of FAO, which marks also World Food Day. And this year, World Food Day team is dedicated to the right to foods for a better life and a better future. And it aims to highlight the importance of food diversity, affordability, accessibility, safety, and nutrition. It is therefore, I believe, a perfect uh, opportunity today to reaffirm our collective commitment to the realization of the right to food for all. Before we, we dive in, the discussion today. Let me take you through the agenda and share some housekeeping rules. First, the webinar will last for approximately 90 minutes and will be recorded. Uh, I'm asking you to keep your microphone muted uh, during the session if you are participating online. And we encourage you to post comments and questions uh, using the, uh, the Q&A uh, module, which we'll be using uh, to respond either live uh, in writing or when we have time in the Q&A session uh, for, for to, to animate this session. The session will begin with uh, opening uh, remarks uh, from Mr. Fabio Vera Soares, the director of the international studies at the Brazilian Institute of Applied Economic Research. Uh, we will then hear from our uh, distinguished speakers. Firstly, to set the scene, we'll hear from Ms. Uh, Lauren Phillips, the deputy director of the FAO uh, Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division, and from Mr. Todd Holland, the Chief of Development and Economic and Social Rights Branch at OECHR, who is uh, with us today. And they will both unpack, unpack the right to, to, adequate, uh, to adequate food, human rights-based approaches, social security, and the important connection between, between the right to food and social protection. We'll then hear from uh, several uh, high-level speakers uh, from uh, Nepal and uh, and South Africa, 
uh, uh, where initiatives are underway to ensure rights-based approaches to social protection uh, that ensure uh, adequate food for all is uh, ongoing. So warm welcome to uh, to everyone. And uh, these countries uh, case studies will be followed by reaction and remarks uh, to feed the discussion by both uh, Ms. Uh, Suarez, uh, monitoring and accountability expert from Pian International, a member of the civil society and indigenous people mechanism of the um, Committee on World Food Security. So welcome to you as well. And by Mr. Michael Winfur, uh, Deputy uh, Director of the German Institute for Human Rights and member of the UN Committee for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And I saw uh, Michael there online, so warm welcome, Michael, to you as well. Uh, we'll finish today's session with a, a, a Q&A, and this is where I'm asking you to post your question online, or of course, if you're in the room, you can ask them uh, directly. So. To start, uh, let me start by giving the floor indeed for opening uh, um, remarks uh, to Mr. Fabio Vera Soares, Director of International Studies at the Brazilian Institute of Applied Economic Research. Uh, Mr. Um, Soares, the floor is yours and warm welcome. Thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and also thank you very much for, for the invitation to, to speak to you today um, on the eve of this very important day, uh, the anniversary of FAO. Um, as we don't have the video, I just have been um, alerted that we do technical problems, we won't be able to show the video that presents the, the, the Global Alliance Against Hunger and Poverty. Um, I'm going to try to summarize a little bit the rationale uh, and how the Alliance actually can contribute to the realization of the right to social security and the right to adequate food. Um, the, the, the Alliance has been, I mean, it's been uh, designed and it's been uh, sort of implemented uh, within uh, the work of the G20. So I would like to go back a little bit to how the G20 was elevated to the level of Minister of Finance and Head of Central Banks into this gathering of uh, world leaders. Uh, that was basically due to the 2008 and nine crisis uh, that was at the time we called it the triple crisis. And one of the crises, one of the F um, of the crisis was actually the food crisis. And, and then one of the key responses um, to the food crisis at that moment was actually to try to scale up social protection and to improve knowledge sharing between middle-income countries and low-middle-income countries in order to implement social protection programs and social protection systems to, to respond to the food crisis. Um, I, I would highlight um, two things that happened at that time. One was the creation of the SPIAC-B, the Social Protection Interagency Cooperation Board, that was meant to improve cooperation among uh, UN agencies and also IFIs, uh, particularly the World Bank. So we have the Secretariat that brings together ILO and um, the World Bank. Uh, but also uh, FAO has had a key um, uh, role uh, in bringing uh, food security and nutrition and the importance of social protection to foster food security and nutrition uh, when they are implemented. And more important than that, how a social protection program should be designed in order to improve food security uh, indicators. Uh, after that, also in the realm of, realm of the G20, there was lots of work within the development working group uh, in order to ensure food security and nutrition in particular, particularly uh, in monitoring prices and availability and accessibility of, of foods. So for example, uh, a means that also uh, implemented by FAO is one of the outcomes of the work of the G20. So the G20 work since its beginning has been pretty much related to, to the response both from the social security side, but also uh, for the food security sites in order uh, to avoid that the prices 
and that the lack of coordination at the global level would jeopardize the achievement of SDG 1 and 2. Uh, of course, all this work is started even before SDGs, we're still at the time of the Millennium Development Goals. But with SDGs, the Development Working Group became, uh, within the D20, the, fora, the forum uh, to discuss this type of measures. So what happened in the case of Brazil? So Brazil was quite influential uh, in this process. Brazil was key to deliver South-South cooperation regarding uh, food security programs, but also uh, social, social security or social protection, particularly our uh, flagship uh, conditional cash transfer program, also for media, that was quite influential both in Latin America in the very beginning, but also in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Brazil also at the time um, actually exits the, the hunger map. That was something that, that was highlighted uh, in the second Lula administration and first Dilma administration. But then um, with the crisis, we got back in the map. So it became a priority of the current administration to take Brazil out of the hunger map. And given that Brazil was hosting the G20, uh, the presidency of the, the rotating presidency of G20 this year, um, the President Lula decided that uh, the fight against hunger and poverty that we are doing in Brazil should also come at the global level. Of course, all the reports that we got from the UN uh, on the progress of SDG 1 that got a little bit off track, particularly for low income countries. Uh, but also for SDG 2, with the SOFI showing uh, that uh, we have increased hunger and food insecurity worldwide, particularly uh, with the crisis and the, the response that was, uh, maybe there was a response, but it was not as good as possible in, uh, for the COVID-19, the realm of food security. It decided to turn it into one of, of the priorities or the presidential priorities of the G20. So that was basically the rationale uh, to bring uh, the task force for the fight, for the establishment of a global alliance against hunger and poverty. So how the alliance is going to work? The alliance has basically two pillars. One is a national pillar in which the countries that want to adhere to the alliance uh, pledge what they want to do for their own policy to ensure the right to food security and the right to social security. And, and that's important to highlight that in the spirit of the SDGs, even developed countries should speak out, to spell out what they're going to do internally to improve their own uh, uh, performance, to improve the performance of both food security and nutrition, but also uh, social security coverage. We saw in ILO reports, for example, there are still important gaps even in high income countries. Uh, the second aspect is actually to, uh, the second and third aspect is actually related to SDG uh, 17. It's basically to look at the means of implementation and that uh, includes uh, not only the knowledge sharing that was quite highlighted in the first phase of the G20 work, but also the financing. I would highlight uh, that the task force has put lots of effort, including commissioning some background papers, looking at uh, where are the sources, where are the fundings that can actually be used to implement at the national level uh, programs and policies that can improve both the right to social security and the right to food security and nutrition and try to look at the synergies that can be built uh, among them. So for that, we have a pillar that's basically the financing, uh, the financing pillar, and the third one is the knowledge sharing one. So the alliance, uh, through its support mechanism that's going to be hosted by FAO, uh, wants actually to, to be a matchmaker or brokering uh, among countries that wants to adhere to the alliance and are going to ask for support, uh, both on the financial and on the knowledge pillar and find where the resources and the te technical capacity are. So basically that's the contribution uh, that we you want to do. And we look forward to work not only with the UN and the IFI uh, institutions that are working already supporting the task force, but also uh, with the countries and going beyond the G20 because the Alliance, although it has been born from the G20, it's not meant to be for the G20 countries. It's actually to work at the global level. 
And we do expect with this work that we're going to accelerate progress towards SDG one and two with all the spillover effects that we know that the head, that has been with the proved policies that are going to be uh, supported by the Alliance and they are going to be posted in what we are calling these um, baskets of policy instruments that have a proven report with um, robust evaluations showing that they are effective and that countries can adapt them to their context. So we look forward to working with all of you and ensure that the right to social security and to food is going to be adequately implemented in worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Soares, for being with us and for briefing us so clearly while I think it's around four o'clock in the morning in Brazil where you are speaking from. So, so this is really uh, highly appreciated. Thank you also for the, the sponsorship by Brazil of the, the event uh, today uh, for briefing us indeed on G20 related uh, uh, work uh, to uh, uh, social protection and food security uh, for also for briefing us on uh, on the effort you are you have been undertaking both, I would say, nationally uh, to take Brazil out of the anger map, as you said, but also globally in the context of the global alliance against uh, anger, uh, with the, the the three pillars, the national pillar, and I find very interesting that you refer to both developing and developed uh, country, which have indeed to uh, to work towards accelerating progress in terms of the implementation of SDG 1 and 2, the financing pillar and the knowledge pillar. And uh, in that respect, I find the, the, the point on the basket of policy instruments uh, particularly important. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have a fair commitment to, uh, to work with Brazil. And I think the, the, there has been a, there is constant dialogue in that respect uh, at the highest level with the Director General uh, being very, very committed to the task. So thank you very much, Mr. Soares. I hope, despite the very early hour, you can uh, stay with us. But if you can't, we would perfectly understand as well. Uh, so again, thank you so much. And uh, now uh, I would like to, uh, to turn to my colleague, uh, Lauren Phillips, uh, who will... Um, speak about the link, the interlinkages between the right to adequate food and social protection from an FAO uh, perspective. So it's not, it's not so early in Rome, so uh, <laughs> over to you, uh, Thank you uh, so much, Dominique. Thank you, Dominique, and good morning, um, everyone there, and good afternoon, um, and very early good morning to Fabio and to those of you that are in the Americas. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today to join this series again um, and to talk about something so critical, which is the link between social protection and human rights-based approaches, especially the right to food. Um, as you know, World Food Day is tomorrow. Uh, the theme for this year is World Food Day is right to foods. And so it's very timely. Um, also because we're coming up on the 20th anniversary this month of the FAO Council's adoption of the voluntary guidelines um, in support of the progressive realization of the right to adequate food or what we call the right to food guidelines. And so for both of these reasons, I'm very happy to try to explain a little bit about the link between the human rights-based approaches and the right to food and social protection today. Um, but apart from the sort of celebratory or anniversary kind of messages that I wanted to deliver, I also wanted to start by reminding everyone just how far out of reach the right to adequate food is for so many people globally um, and what the high cost that people are paying um, in terms of lack of peace and security and, the, and our economies and the planet by not having access to adequate food. And particularly, I wanted to mention, of course, that conflict is a major driver of lack of, of adequate food for many people. And we're seeing terrible conflicts, of course, in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in, South, in Sudan and elsewhere in the world. And I think it's worth while we're celebrating World Food Day tomorrow and the 20th anniversary of the Right to Food guidelines to notice just how far behind we are, unfortunately, still in protecting the right to food in conflicts, but also globally. We still have 730 million people suffering from hunger, according to FAO's latest estimates in the, in the SOFI report, and progress is stalled. Um, in 2023, we have you know, almost 30% of the global population or 2.3 billion people 
who are suffering from either moderate or severe food insecurity. Um, and at the same time, we have abundance of food in other parts of the world. And so we have other types of problems um, like high rates of overweight and obesity in countries and regions across the world with a billion people also living um, in a, with obesity, according to our colleagues at the World Health Organization. So just to give you a sense of how the right to food uh, is thought about as operationalized, the right to food is the right uh, when every man, woman, and child alone or in a community has physical and economic access at all times to adequate food or a way to buy that food. And it's a fundamental right for all people to be free from hunger. Um, states and non-state actors can facilitate people's right to food uh, by um, providing food assistance or social safety nets, the kinds of things we're talking about today, social protection, to help realize the right to food for all of their citizens. Um, and, you know, we've already heard from our colleague Fabio in Brazil a little bit about the, some of the social protection programs that the Brazilian government has had as its flagships and those um, programs and their contribution to the right to food in Brazil. And I'm sure that we'll hear more excellent examples from colleagues from um, other agencies and countries in, in the following um, interventions. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the what the right to food guidelines, which as I mentioned, have, are about to have their 20th anniversary, what they, what they say. Um, they have 19 specific policy areas, which help to help to governments and non-state actors to realize the right to food. Um, and they ask actors to work on the progressive realization of those rights by creating an enabling environment where people can feed themselves with dignity um, and where uh, rights of all are respected. Um, and so, you know, I think what we can say is that we, when we take a rights-based approach or when we think about the right to food, we focus not on charity or doing something uh, for good, but entitlements, rights. The right to food is a right. It's not a privilege. It's not something that requires us to uh, act in, in charity. It's something that we are required to do from a legal standpoint, right? And it recognizes that individuals are the holders of those rights and that they in, are entitled, each of them with dignity to food security and nutrition, rather than being dependent on support, which could be discretionary. Um, it reminds governments that they have an obligation to people and social protection can play an important part in ensuring that those obligations are met. Um, you know, when we think about the right to food, we're also thinking about rights-based approaches, which means that we need to think through uh, what we call the Panther principles, that making sure we have participation and inclusion of all people, that we hold actors to account, that we do not discriminate, and that we apply the law equally with transparency, that we focus on human dignity, empowerment, and agency, and the rule of law. And all of those things are ways to think about how governments and other actors can implement social protection programs, which um, help us to realize the right to food and are rights-based. Um, and so, you know, I think all of those sounds already like a very high task and a high ask, but we should remember that these rights and the right to food are linked to other types of rights, like right to healthcare, education, land, water, sanitation, social protection, and that helping to achieve the, the progressive right to food helps us to realize those other rights and puts us on a path towards making sure that all of these rights are recognized and met. Um, so I would just like to say that uh, as I sort of move towards concluding that social protection can play a very important role in providing a floor against income variability and helps to stabilize people's consumption of adequate food across their life cycle, life cycle whether we're talking about very young children, uh, school age children, or if we're talking about older people, women of reproductive age. So social protection can play a role across the life cycle in ensuring that people have adequate culturally appropriate amounts of food, that they can procure food, particularly when there's crises. We saw this very strongly during COVID-19. Social protection can play a strong role in ensuring that people have access to adequate food um, or during times of war, as I mentioned at the start. Um, and I would also like to say that it's encouraging that we have at this sort of 20 year anniversary of the right to food guidelines, a number of ways that we're using uh, social protection to help realize the right to food, like the global accelerator 
on jobs and social protection, and of course, the Global Alliance Against Hunger and Poverty, which Fabio just outlined a bit for you, which can be important catalysts for change and for improving rights-based approaches and the, and the right to adequate food. Um, I think we should try to mainstream these rights-based approaches across all of our efforts to combat hunger and poverty um, so that we can ensure that social protection and other measure, measures help us to achieve you know, universal uh, right to adequate food for all individuals. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other speakers today um, and especially our colleagues from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and Fian, and I appreciate all of you for gathering in what appears to be a small room, as you mentioned, Dominique. So I think uh, next time this series, and we'll need a bigger room to, to host everybody, especially around World Food Day. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you indeed, Lauren. We are victim of the success of this, uh, <laughs> of this series. So we need to move to a, to a bigger room. It's not so small. There are smaller ones, but uh, definitely a bigger one. So thank you, Lauren, indeed for your intervention, for reminding us that right to food is not about charity, but entitlement. It's a right and not a privilege. And uh, and also, uh, indeed, for highlighting towards the end that social protection can play a role as a role to play in uh, stabilizing access to food and food consumption, especially uh, to go through a crisis and finally on the importance of mainstreaming uh, those uh, right-based uh, approaches. So thank you very much, Laurent. And now I am turning uh, to uh, Todd Holland uh, from OHCHR uh, to further set the scene. And uh, uh, Todd would be great if you could help us understand the concept of human rights and particularly the right to social security and how it secures better life for all, including the right to adequate food. Over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Dominic, and um, good morning, good afternoon. For, um, for everyone here, colleagues, excellencies, um, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is very pleased to participate in this um, and partner with FAO and the permanent mission of Brazil. Um, what for us is important is to, to remind people that human rights guardrails should be utilized for decision making. And that decision making relates to all rights, including the right to food and the right to social security. Um, this year we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the right to food guidelines. These guidelines spell out the interlinkages between social protection and the right to food, building on the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. In 2018, the Declaration of the Rights of the Persons, the, the Rights of Peasants and Other Workers in Rural Areas, under outline the interconnection between social protection, the right to food, and, and the right to work. Um, after listening both to Fabio and, uh, and Lauren, I thought it was important to look at what we really are talking about and the challenge that we're, that we're facing. In the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was created in the context of the, the Great Depression, the economic downturn, the concentration of wealth and power, the war, and massive human rights violations. I hate to say that we've we're in the same position today, but in many ways, we're in the same position today. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was designed to, to apply to all aspects of society, including the economy, in order to create an inclusive, prosperous, and peaceful societies. And I wanna reinforce that. It was, a, it was taking into consideration the problems that we were facing and saying, okay, human rights should apply in all of these areas. So what happened? Lauren just indicated that a third of the world population is suffering from food insecurity. How have we created a food system that is so radical that one third of the people are excluded from it? Why have we treated human rights as somehow optional? 
In some ways, we, we fear, uh, you know, too many of us perhaps studied neoclassical economics and, and believed its assumptions that the best possible result comes from an unfettered market. Well, I would say that one third of the world population would indicate that it's not true. And, the, and as both Fabio and Lauren pointed out, that creates a huge number of problems relative to instability, human suffering. And the solution is, is in sight. We can see that it's a matter of policy choices as Brazil and Fabio have, have demonstrated. We need, to, we need to get beyond the fear of imposing guardrails on our economic system and specifically when it relates to a right like the right to food. Um, I think one of the problems in the, in the UN is that we're quite good at, at getting papers uh, out that are excellent. Our problem is getting people to actually in member states to, to take them seriously. Human rights should be part of economic policy, investment decisions, business decisions, and consumer choices. It should be conscious in terms of what we understand in terms of are we imposing human rights costs on others through our transactions? We're all part of the problem. When I was serving uh, in Equatorial Guinea, Rwanda, Angola, DRC, and Colombia, um, and then also um, where I'm from, Los Angeles, I could see um, hunger and poverty up close. And that, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is something that we, we need to just say, this can stop. In the context of the peace negotiation in Colombia, which our office was, was very engaged in, uh, we worked with civil society actors, with both, uh, with both parties to the conflict. And one of the really interesting things that existed there was that they wanted to do local purchases in the context of the FARC reintegration. And this isn't rocket science. It was, it was designed to help create right to, to, to respect the right to work, the right to food, and create a, a new beginning. But what happened? The people who implemented the project turned to the market, and then basically the market, of course, um, made bids, and then they started to ship food from Bogota way out to these different places. There wasn't employment in the places where the FARC was demobilizing, and you can see the result today. When we try to use policy that affects more than one thing, the market is very bad for creating efficiency. Here we are trying to create multiple. We are trying to create multiple benefits from the same money, and it's hard when you then put it out for a bid and who has the lowest bid. Lauren pointed out the statistics relative to the problems relative um, relative to the to current levels of um, right to right to food. I think what what's important is that Social Security. Um, has been a right since the Universal Declaration and before, and that it really is possible to use social security system to create food security in the context even of uh, our current food systems. Social security is an enabling right that supports the realization of all human rights, not only right to food, health, but it's about creating an adequate benefit in amount and duration to create an adequate standard of living. States oftentimes limit their social security relative to a contributory program. We need to follow the examples that exist and see that it should be both contributory and non-contributory schemes because often the people that are most left behind are those that don't participate in the non, in the contributory schemes. Social protection 
addresses the root causes of poverty is even a better process. And here I'll, I'll try to explain. The, the adoption of universal social protection for is anchored in human rights norm is so important because it's not just about providing a monthly amount of money. It's about thinking through inclusion because economic inclusion is critical to creating a sustained and prosperous society. Um, this year, uh, we're organizing a, a number of regional consultations on economic social and cultural rights, focusing on the right to food and the right to social security. Um, we're doing this with, with Fiona. It's been super important for us to understand what the rights holders are saying, what the duty bearers are saying, and working with them to say, okay, there are examples that can be used to address these problems. It's a policy choice. I think in conclusion, because they, I already spoke longer than they told me to, <laughs> is that, um, you know, making money, I, I, I don't want to come off as like, oh my God, you know, this guy is, is such a, a radical. I mean, making money is fine, but that even lots of money is fine. The problem is if you're making money imposing human rights costs on others, it's not okay. We need to see human rights, and that's what we're talking about guardrails. They need to actually apply to decision making. Again, economic policy, business investment decisions, and consumer choices. We need to create that playing field that's, that's level for everybody based on human rights. And if we do that, then we will see the importance of and how the right to social protection and the right to food would be respected. So I, I thank you very much for being able to participate in this, uh, in this event. And that I, I, I did wanna end with one thing is that uh, I used to work for Ethel Kennedy and she always said, how many people will come to the event? And we said, 100. She said, make sure the room is 70 or 75 people. So it gives this impression that, that people are really interested. <laughs> and so I can see Fao has taken this. With Gaston, yeah, no, thank you very much. And for the colleagues online, they, they need to know that they don't see the, the entire room because actually it seems even smaller when you, <laughs> you watch on the video, but actually it's bigger than that. But but thank you so much, uh, Todd. I mean, wow, very interesting. And thank you for, I would say, taking us back to, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? And why it was uh, designed to, to really uh, apply to all aspects of, uh, of society. Uh, you said at least twice that uh, human rights uh, need to be part of the uh, economic uh, policy making, business decision and consumer choices, which I think is, is indeed uh, very important. Of course, then you made the link to the, 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 the use of uh, social security to create food security and to create adequate standard of, of living. Can you refer to some of the, the good example of social security schemes that, that have to yeah, in, include both contributory and non-contributory parts to make sure that indeed the more vulnerable can indeed benefit uh, from it. So I would not attempt to make a, a comprehensive summary of what you said because it was very, very rich. And uh, thank you very much for that. And I'm sure we will have more dialogues on that where you will be able to contribute. So now we will move to a, to a country uh, case uh, study. Uh, where we will have uh, South Africa um, sharing their uh, example where they've been able to establish important uh, right-based social protection measures. And we learn all such measures have been developed, how they will they have been implemented and what uh, the, the challenges are and how those challenges are or will be uh, overcome. So for that, uh, I'm delighted to pass the floor to Mr. Julian May, the director of the Department of uh, Science and Innovation and National Research Foundation Center of Excellence in Food Security uh, in South Africa. Uh, Mr. May, uh, 
thank you for being with us uh, this morning and the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you very much for the very kind invitation and good day colleagues. Um, so I'm wearing two hats today. The one is uh, as, a, as, a, as a National Planning Commissioner. Uh, very briefly, the National Planning Commission is an independent body of um, experts who are appointed by the President of South Africa and whose responsibility is to oversee the implementation of our long-term national development plan. This is a plan that runs for 30 years. We have six years to go, um, and we are now already starting to think about what will follow the current national development plan. I'm also a professor at the University of Western Cape, where I lead a research center focusing on food security that is funded by our National Research Foundation, and as the, the Center of Excellence in Food Security. I'm really grateful to be given the opportunity to present to you. I've done some work on social protection with colleagues at the FAO over the last couple of years, and some of what I'll be talking about reflects on, on that work um, and thinking about the, the international experience. Apologies. Um, the... Very briefly, South Africa has a long history of, of adopting human rights um, and a human rights approach to our issues around food security. Um, the Bill of Rights in the National South African Constitution embeds the right to food. Um, we have also a signature to the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which includes specific focus on the rights of children. Um, we are a signature of the African Charter and Rights on Welfare, also of the child again, which focuses on the, on, on the food security of children. We've implemented a range of policies um, and programs that support those constitutional rights, starting with our integrated nutrition program that was introduced in 1994. That is just after the transition to democracy in South Africa, um, reflecting again the importance that um, food security has been given throughout the history of South Africa. Um, the first president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, is well known for his comments about specifically, again, the rights of the children and the rights of children to food. I, I mentioned children because I'm going to come back to that because South Africa is unusual in that children are given quite specific rights um, when it comes to the issues around food and nutrition. We have a range of policies, our integrated food and nutrition security policy, and then a strategy that introduced in, was introduced in 2017. And that national food and nutrition security strategy is currently being reworked again, having concluded its first five years of being implemented. Um, there are a range of other issues. And well, in the uh, NGO society is also active. There are campaigns that focus on issues around child, um, child, security, child rights, uh, and as well as issues around focusing around the rights of adults. Um, Healer, a well-known NGO, campaigns vigorously for rights concerning access to healthy food, not only sufficient food, recognizing the obesity um, and, and overweight issues that were already raised by, I think, Lauren. Our National Development Plan has a, a strong focus on children. Children are mentioned in almost half of the pages of the document, which I specifically raise how children fit into the National Development Plan. And um, the issue of food security is raised in a, in a chapter that deals with both agriculture and also the provision of food. And finally, as I've already mentioned, um, when it comes to the issues around children, they're affected by all of the strategic development goals, including goal to the reduction, the elimination of hunger. Next slide, please. <laughs> Now, the advantage of this is that uh, having a, con a constitutional, having human rights embedded in our constitution means that we have a couple of advantages. Firstly, that it is a legally binding obligation. Um, the mandate is clear about the right to sufficient food and also the right to water. So it's placed at the same level as the right to water. Second, the constitution also includes a clause around progressive realization, which mandates that the, the state must take reasonable action and within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of this right. Again, it goes further than that in the case of children, it is an absolute right. So the state must address the food and security rights of children, despite the, the, the situation regarding resources. Um, and then the constitution allows us to link up to our international obligations, such as the UN Convention on the Rights of Child. 
Having the, the right to food security in our constitution also provides us with a framework of, of accountability. It means that there is the possibility for constitutional enforcement. Our constitutional court can enforce the right, of, or, 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 or the right to food via the courts. It's also then embedded in our long-term planning, and I've already mentioned that the NDP itself covers the, the question of the right to food. I'm not there, thank you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> going, going further, the implications include linking economic access to food to, to social protection. So this shifts away from recognizing that food security can be achieved for food production and acknowledges that economic access is important. Social protection then becomes one of the most important ways in which we can ensure that people have economic access to food. Um, our protection programs, are, 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 we have a range of social protection programs, which include the most recently introduced social relief of distress grant that was introduced during COVID as a way of addressing the situations of dire hunger that, uh, that emerged during our extended lockdown. Our child support grant, which was which was introduced in, 20, in 1997, um, now reaching almost 13 million children with almost perfect coverage. And our national school nutrition program, often forgotten as a form of social protection, but is a particularly critical way in which the state attempts to fulfill its constitutional obligations regarding the access, access to food. Next slide, please. But in practice, we don't fare so well. Although intended to help children and other vulnerable pe people, the grants that I've mentioned can tend to get stretched over other household needs. Um, we have an extraordinarily high level of adult unemployment in South Africa, over 30% of adults being unemployed. And that means that households have become dependent upon grants that were intended for others. This means that they are insufficient to meet the cost of purchasing a nutritious basket. Widespread hunger continues. About 20% of households are food insecure, and people who are living in formal settlements in urban areas are the largest group at risk. Ironically, farm workers are also identified as an exceptionally vulnerable group, even though they are the ones growing the food. Particularly worrying is our, uh, is our prevalence of child stunting. It's high, running at around 20%, 27% of under five children, and it has unchanged since 1993. Um, this really is quite alarming since South Africa has adopted very similar policies to those mentioned by our former, by, by Fabio when he talked about Brazil, um, but we have not yet had the success that Brazil has had in reducing child stunting. Some of the reasons for this have been investigated. My center has looked at um, why child stunting has persisted. One of the factors is the unhealthy um, environmental conditions within which ch most many children live. And as a result, children experience high levels, high prevalence of diarrhea, and this seems to wash out the nutrients resulting in the, in the stunting that we've talked about. But income ultimately is, is a fundamental cause. Income because pe so many people are unemployed. We also have high levels of micronutrient deficiencies and the, and the figures are there that you can see. And children are also growing up in obesogenic environments, even when they are in school. One in five children are overweight or obese, a quite scary statistic. Um, for the, in the case of adults, some 60% of adult women are overweight or obese, and South Africa has one of the highest prevalences of diabetes um, in the world as a result of this. Another linked fa factor relating to food security, and again also the issues around the right to food, is that while research shows that mothers intend to breastfeed, um, to exclusively breastfeed, their socioeconomic conditions prevent this, and this is abetted by the aggressive marketing of formula milk products. The early childhood development um, strategy of South Africa is also an important way of reaching preschool children. Um, if, a, if a centre is, is, is supported by our National Department of Social Development, it is also able to offer food to those preschool children. But only 10% of the South Africa's preschool children have access to such centres. In short, although the policies are in place, policy coordination is not an implementation is a concern. Next slide, please. Now, I was asked if I could comment on to what extent has having a constitutionally embedded right to food assisted in protecting our social protection scheme? And I've given you just some very some recent examples. Um, I'll start with the, with the most recent in 2022 down the bottom there. Um, following the removal of the, 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 the um, preventative measures during the COVID lockdown, um, government attempted to adjust the regulations concerning its social, so, its social relief of distress grant. It was challenged by an NGO, Black Sash, 
um, who argued that the new regulations were in fact counter to the notion of progressive realization of the right to food. Um, it, this did, this was a, a case was lodged, but did not actually go to the constitutional court. Instead, the Department of Social Development recognized that it was going to that it would most likely lose such a case and amended the regulations, resulting in the withdrawal of the legal application by Black Sash. During COVID, Equal Education, another NGO, filed a legal case to ensure the continuation of school meals during the COVID-19 lockdown. As I mentioned, our national school feeding program is, is one element of our social protection program. In all provinces except one, the government decided to stop the school feeding program during the, 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 the early months of 2020. Um, this was taken to court and the court ruled the government must resume the national, national school nutrition program. Other examples go back and I've given you just two there from 2017 and 2018. Once again, Black Sash challenging um, our agency that is responsible for the distribution of social grants, SASA, um, for mismanaging those grants. The Constitutional Court again ruled that SASA had violated its obligation um, and ruled that uh, the, pr the problems causing those grants not to, um, not to be paid need to be resolved immediately. Um, and, and again, at a smaller example here, a community challenging a mining project that threatened land and water resources that were vital for its agriculture. And again, the, co the court law, the communities must be consulted in such projects. So it gives you some examples there that having the right embedded in the constitution, having a constitutional court allows uh, civil society to be able to hold government to account when attempts are taken to try and reduce the impact of social protection. Next slide, please. So this is my almost concluding slide. Some challenges in realizing the right to food in South Africa. Ultimately, we seem to be dealing in South Africa with a food system paradox. Like the world, we are, we are food secure at a national level. Um, there is enough food produced. Unlike many countries, we have a relatively comprehensive policy framework. We have an international competitive farming sector and strong science and innovation sector. Despite all of this, despite having the right to food embedded in the constitution, many South Africans continue to experience food insecurity in terms of hunger, insufficient nu nutrients, and, and overweight and obesity. There's also been insufficient support. While the, we have had, it, while we introduced a grant to deal with the, co the hunger that resulted from, from, from COVID, it stagnated. It, it has remained at the same level and it has eroded its, in, in terms of its value in real terms. Um, in the, in the case of the child support grant, vital for meeting the needs of children, increases each year are less than the food price inflation. We also still have eligibility barriers. In the case of social, social relief or distress grant, these are quite high, with about 50% of those eligible for the grant um, estimated to be excluded due to uh, um, the criteria and bureaucratic hurdles. We face not only a question of hunger, we face this double burden of malnutrition. Again, in common with many countries in the world, but again, in, South, in, in Africa, we are the most extreme country in terms of dealing with stunting, micronutrient deficiencies, and rising rates of childhood obesity. And then we have some policy gaps. There's no framework that exists specifically for the right to food. Um, although it is in our constitution, it is not, has not been carried forward well into the, the strategies and policies that exist. Next slide, please. So then recommendations. Um, as a National Planning Commission, we are working towards closing this policy gap and starting to draft framework that would be able to put in place the, the legislation that we would need. We are also arguing for the need to reform eligibility criteria, increase the value of the grant, and to provide alternative methods to be able to access the grant. Um, the Commission is also looking into double duty opportunities where we can link food security through other economic policies through better running social protection systems. Here we're starting to think about how to link into the food system and an example here would be to improve our national school feeding program and, how, and its procurement process in order to provide balanced meals that address both um, hunger and, uh, and overnutrition but link state procurement to the local food systems. And lastly we recognize the importance of public engagement. The Planning Commission will be holding hosting a round table on food security in, 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 during November, where we will be engaging both with government departments, um, the legislature, the judiciary, and also civil society. And that is my last slide. You can go to the thank you slide, please. Thank you, slide. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. And cool. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. May, indeed, for your. Uh, presentation and for really uh, providing this very concrete example of uh, 
South Africa and what it means to have uh, the right to food embedded uh, within the, the national constitution and uh, referring even to the to what it means when uh, during COVID uh, there were some people going to court and reminding the, the government of its uh, obligations. So uh, thank you also for, of course, brief us on the on the progress, but also on the remaining challenges, and also for uh, briefing us on what the National Planning Commission is doing to uh, indeed uh, address some of the, the challenges and the and for example the policy gaps uh, which you have identified. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, May, for that. Please stay with us. Uh, and now, um, unfortunately, the, the ambassador of Nepal was supposed to be with us uh, this morning. Was caught up in a in an emergency meeting. Uh, but we are very pleased to have uh, a colleague from the permanent mission of Nepal, Mr. Amar Rai, uh, who is going to uh, also share uh, some words on the Nepalese uh, experience in relation to the uh, social protection in the region. So, Mr. Rai, thank you, Mr. Tse, for giving me the floor. Let me first express my sincere apologies on behalf of my ambassador because. Uh, he's caught off with the high level delegation that has recently arrived from the capital who are here to attend the IPO assembly. That includes the speaker of the Nepal assembly. And so, Mr. Chair, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, Nepal thanks the organizer for convening this recording and progress and giving us a space to be part of this. Nepal attaches most importance to the right to food among other human rights. Previously, our mission here in Geneva is to engage with the food and agricultural organization. But the special responsibility has been shifted to our mission in Vienna right now. Uh, the special responsibility has been shifted to our mission in Vienna right now. However, we have been engaging with the team here in various forums in the international Geneva including by co-sponsoring the relevant resolutions related to the theme in the UN Human Rights Council. The agriculture sector, which contributes around 25% to the national GDP of Nepal, is associated with the livelihoods of around 60.4% of the total population, which is the mainstay of economic prosperity of the country. The constitution of Nepal guarantees the right to food as the fundamental right and ensures the rights and interests of farmers to policies regarding agriculture and land reform. The rights of farmers are also ensured in the Right to Food and so Food Sovereignty Act 2018. The National Periodic Plan aims to modernize and commercialize the agriculture sector through necessary support and incentives provided for large-scale production, processing, and marketing of agriculture produce by bringing together smallholder farmers into cooperatives. The Agricultural Development Strategy 2015 to 2035 emphasizes on commercialization, mechanization, and diversification of agricultural and livestock products to make the sector competitive. The recently endorsed seed production supply and management directive has provisions to provide incentive grants to the advanced seeds producers. Several programs, including the Prime Minister Agriculture Modernization Project, Advanced Seed Program Project for income raising of small and medium farmers, Agriculture Insurance Program, and Minimum Support Price Program have been implemented to ensure food and nutrition security. Mr. Chair, people are agencies of peace and roadmap for tomorrow. Social protection prepares them to be physically, mentally, and emotionally capable to contribute to the societal welfare in the world as a whole. Sustainable future is unattainable if the child of today can't have access to care, education, health, and nutrition. Access to a wide range of social protection is to be ensured by both the families and the state in case of Nepal. Inclusivity has been guaranteed by recognizing the special needs of persons who are helpless, persons with disabilities, 
who are conflict victims, who are displaced or vulnerable. The primary bottlenecks for the implementation of the inclusive social protection are lack of adequate state resources and infrastructures, low income and high cost of living and awareness. It is sad that children in rural, rural areas and low income families get deprived of social protection the most. Actually, they are the one who, uh, who have been the most vulnerable sections of the society. Adequate employment and cooperation between the government, private sectors and international community to provide support is the key to address inclusive protection, social protection for all of them. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Rai, for, for sharing the, the, your uh, experience from Nepal and briefing us on efforts towards implementation of the right to food and social protection. Uh, the plan to access to aim to provide people with to a, a wide range of uh, uh, inclusive social protection and highlighting this notion of uh, inclusivity. So uh, thank you so much, uh, sir, for for, for for your presentation. Of course, highlighting the the challenges that also remain and, and always could be addressed. So thank you very much for for coming and for taking over from uh, the ambassador. So uh, with that, I would like now to turn uh, to uh, Ms. Uh, Suarez from Fian International. Uh, Fian has recently highlighted the crucial relationship between care and the right to uh, food. Can you help us grasp the importance of bringing care into the discussion around social protection and the right to adequate food for us? So Anna Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh for organizing that to you, to the right to food uh, unit of the FAO and the, the High Commissioner. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. I do want to remember for those who do not know FIAN that we uh, are an, an, a civil society organization working for the right to food since uh, 1986 with when Michael Michel Vintour was part of our funders. And uh, one of our <laughs> uh, main uh, contributions is that we really try to go to the ground and to learn from uh, the people in the field, from the affected communities by uh, violations of the right to food, to also try to change uh, policies uh, and, uh, at national, regional and international level. And then the hard work thought to convince that what we get at the international level is also implemented by states uh, and by local governments uh, and other policymakers. Um, and I would like to highlight uh, that in this long way, which uh, many people have contributed, uh, of course, uh, all the work that we have been doing with the Committee on Food Security and also with the FAO has been uh, key and uh, therefore, um, it's very important when we go to initiatives like, like the Global Alliance, when we go to other initiatives to take into account that there is a comprehensive framework on the right to food that is evolving every day, uh, that includes all these uh, instruments developed uh, by the committee, but also some work done here in Geneva, <clears throat> like, for example, the UN declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples and the rights of peasants, uh, the general comment uh, 34 of the CEDAW on rural women, and, and many of those are also to see in the national constitutions. Uh, so um, just, just to remember that, and also going very back uh, before I go to the future, um, just to remember that they, in the UN declaration, when you read the Travaux uh, Preparatoire, you can see how the seeds of the connection between the right to food and social security were already inside. Mm -hmm. Some states like Poland wanted provision of food. Some states wanted more social security, like France. Others wanted the access to land, like uh, China. Others wanted the connection to work, and it was the US. So uh, these, are, these were seeds planted uh, many, many years ago, 76 years ago. Um, but now the evolution of international law continues and also on the right to food. And I would like to highlight three issues, uh, beginning with the issue of care and, and the connection between care, social security and food. And then maybe uh, very, very uh, quickly to speak about um, 
two problems that we see regarding the privatized corporate based uh, food banking and also um, the issue of digitalization. So going quickly uh, to the issue of care, um, the discussion there is that the system that we have is mainly uh, based on uh, very different productive and reproductive ways. Uh, we see what is at the top of the iceberg. We see agriculture, we see the industrial food systems, we see the big uh, supermarkets, but all the contribution that women uh, do and that people who care for others do is uh, ignored and uh, without recognizing this care to realize the right to food is very difficult. The same as uh, realizing the right to food without care is impossible. Um, and uh, this work <coughs> normally is not recognized and valued, um, and uh, especially when the care work is done by the most marginalized groups like for example, um, women, peasant women, or a marginalized group of groups of communities. This work includes not only the domestic work or the breastfeeding, but also the care for nature that many uh, peasants and fishes women and other uh, rural women do. Um, a lot of this uh, work is not quantifiable, uh, and it, this includes uh, also social and cultural aspects. So um, in this sense, the care work and the right to food are connected through the entire food systems and through the entire span of life with a vision of intersectionality. And then we have social security as a way to connect the two of them and to ensure uh, that the right to food is realized so long uh, our uh, public policies recognize this care work, remunerate this case work that can be done through different tra transference to contrib through contributive and not contributive systems. Mm -hmm. It includes redistributing the care tasks, uh, which means also changing patriarchal patterns where very often only women take care, and even if they are not remunerated, reduction of the care uh, through, for example, institutional support, and on that we can have institutions connected to the social protection and social security systems, and also, of course, the representations uh, of those who take care of others, including poor food, uh, mm -hmm. and are very often not taken into account when the policy decisions mm -hmm. are made, and therefore, very often, the decisions are not effective because they are far from their reality. So this is, is the first uh, quick reference. And other interesting uh, task or, or task that we have challenge we are facing is the impact of the corporate based food banks on social security and the right to food. Uh, this uh, I am relating to a publication that the Global Network for the Right to Food, the Global Alliance for, uh, for Health and FIAN did. A, which is called Charity versus Rights, a False Solution. And uh, in this publication, we highlight how there is a trend um, in the hunger crisis, and especially since COVID, to uh, address food through corporate-based food banking, where these corporations justify giving all the overproduction, excuse me, the overproduction of food to a to the people that are in need, right? And this uh, has different impacts that are challenges for social security systems, including that states are displacing their obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill to corporate actors that are normally not made accountable with the appearance of that being a solution to hunger. So they say, okay, we are doing donations, uh, we give financial support, we contribute to avoid waste, and we also contribute then, therefore, against uh, the tribal environmental crisis. But the thing is not so easy. Um, and while these companies are, are getting huge tax reductions, we see how the people uh, become more dependent. There are not solutions that 
allow people to overcome the, their situation of dependency. In many cases, uh, through the food banks, uh, there is discrimination of people um, or exclusion. Uh, and and uh, the conditions are not always dignified. And in many cases, also the quality of the food is not the food that the people need to be healthy, because of course, this comes from the ultra processed uh, products, I don't want to call that food, that uh, these uh, corporations create. Uh, so in this sense, we think that uh, all those working in social security policies should be attended to that uh, and see how is the impact and how the money is going somewhere else. And even these companies get reductions in taxes many times. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, how we need to ensure the good elements of social security, social protection, um, which includes focusing also on the adequacy, availability, accessibility, sustainability, uh, this could include, uh, for example, all the food school systems. This could include food reserves that allow states to be prepared for social security in the future. And of course, as it has been mentioned, the connection to the regional and local markets in which the people uh, at the community level should be able to bring their experiences. I have to finish here, but maybe in the questions and answers, I can go to the digitalization. Yes, thank yes. you. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Maria, for your for your presentation, for, for articulating very well the, the issues uh, which you refer to, especially the, the issue of care and uh, highlighting the fact that the implication of food is not, uh, is not recognized, uh, not even uh, remunerated. And, uh, and so this is indeed very, very important in the social protection to social security and food, and also uh, sharing the, the concern you have and uh, the problem you see with corporate-based uh, food food uh, banking and then food digitalization, but that will come back perhaps a bit later. So now, thank you so much, uh, Anna Maria, for that. And now uh, let me turn to, uh, to Michael. Uh, who has been uh, very, very patient since the beginning and who is an expert of the UN uh, Commission on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And uh, Michael, could you please uh, provide us with an overview uh, of the role of the committee in promoting and upholding the right to food and the right to social protection? Michael, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Then Thanks a lot for inviting all to the committee to speak at this um, event on... Uh, the 20th anniversary of the voluntary guidelines on the right to adequate food and also in the dawn of the uh, right to food day. Uh, for the committee, the two articles uh, uh, 11 on right to adequate standard of living where the right to food is a component of and right to water, housing, energy is all included, just to mention this, and the right to social security, which is article 9, is extremely important. We have developed two general comments on this, uh, number 12 on the right to adequate food and number 19 on the right to social security, which gives some guidance. The general comment on the right to food was even developed after the World Food Summit. You might remember this 1996, which was exactly demanding our committee to draft something on the right to food to make it understandable. And uh, the general comment is also the base for the voluntary guidelines, as you have seen. What I want to say, or I want to start with both, and for us as a committee, it's extremely important if we scrutinize or look into the performance of states. These are the two articles who deal with poverty, uh, at least to the essential element. And it has to do, you can say, with an adequate income, uh, a family or a, a, a individual person might have. Yeah, The general comment on the right to adequate food is even saying, First, the state has the obligation to create an enabling environment so that people can produce food themselves. It's one of the most important com uh, component. And still the majority of all poor people live in rural areas and are producers, farmers, fisher folk, pastoralists, who don't have, for example, adequate access to productive resources, or who don't have access to credits, or who have no access to new research results, or for any other things they might need to op optimal produce. So uh, having an enabling environment for these rural people 
is extremely important. Yeah? If you remember in Maputo, the heads of the African Union uh, agreed in 90, uh, 2003 to invest 10% at least of their national uh, income uh, budgets into rural development. Today, nine of 54 states have achieved this goal. So it shows the big, big gap, which is still there in investing into this enabling environment to produce. But the second layer is also an enabling environment to work for all those who are not self-employed and not producers who live on plantations or maybe in industries or in other sectors where they get an income. It's important that they have a regulation which leads to a decent wage or decent income. I think that is important from, from just any form of employment. And if these two things doesn't work properly, then we come to social security. Social security is the essential pillar of that framework of, uh, let's say, securing an adequate income for people. And uh, we learned from Brazil when they introduced the first, uh, let's say, zero hunger policy that many families, and they made a lot of evaluations of this, said at the end, getting this additional support was exactly freeing me from always looking for the next meal. <laughs> it was uh, families, particularly woman-headed household families, enabling them to maybe look for other alternatives of an income, but also investing maybe into the education of ki kids and so far. So social security is not only being lazy and waiting for some money you get, it's, ex it's essentially also an enabling right. I think that was very fa uh, fairly said by Fabio, and we want to highlight this as a committee. So it's for all those who are too young or too old to maybe have an income from work or from self-employment, or it's for all those, uh, let's say, circumstances where people's, let's say, possibility to, to get an income are interrupted because maybe of injuries of, at work, or maybe because they are, have to leave the area because of climate change, internally displaced persons, migrants, all those groups who don't can afford for themselves at that moment, they need social security. So it's really, as Laureen has said, creating the stability of an income for those in need. And it, it, therefore it goes so closely together with the right to an adequate standard of living, but also with the right to work, as I have said this. So this is the package which is needed. Um, I think what is important then is also um, that uh, the food needs also uh, the long-term supply, <laughs> uh, to, just to mention this. And that has to do also something with the, let's say, sustainability of production, but also the adequacy of food. These components also need to be added to just the income side. Yeah? So all types of also social security, also food supply needs to be adequate in terms of being nutritious, cultural acceptable and safe. But also at the same time, we have to think about how to make, particularly in terms of environmental crisis, the agricultural um, um, supply sustainable. Let me conclude by saying you asked for the way forward. And for the way forward, we as a committee recommend from states first to identify all those groups who are particularly food insecure, identify why they are food insecure, and then design policies to help them. The voluntary guidelines have 19 policy areas, as Laureen was saying, because the right to food is not only related to one budget item. You have to make several things working. So identify the groups, why they are hungry. Some are missing access to land. Others are missing access to social security. Others don't get an adequate pension. So you have to deal with different policy areas. So make be specific in looking into this design policies to help them and then monitoring progress. That is what we recommend from all states. And this also requires that you have enough resources or you invest enough resources. The, our government calls for using the maximum of available resources. And I think this discussion is also important because many states have a very low level of taxes, have a big, huge portion of tax evasion uh, or maybe <laughs> investments going into tax havens and, and so forth. So we need also, <laughs> in that sense, a human rights economy, which makes sure that the resources which are there in many states, they are there, they are really invested also in the particular area which you can call the core of human dignity, yeah, which is Article 11, the right of adequate standard of living and the right to social security. So in that sense, what we have to request from states is investing into this uh, core area of the human dignity. Because if you are hungry, if you don't get enough food during the first thousand days, you will never develop the same opportunities as other people have. And even in countries like myself, I work for the National Human Rights Institution, we can let you know that the life expectancy between the 10 richest percent of our society and the 
Urus 10% is 12 years of difference. So it shows that the, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, all the different discriminations people are facing are really having an impact on the whole, let's say, enjoyment of uh, uh, adequate standard of living. So in that, it's a call for uh, investing and having policies which are helping those who are particularly vulnerable. And that's maybe the message of the right to food guidelines. Yeah? Be specific and help those who are particularly vulnerable. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And well, I was not aware of the statistic you referred to at the end, 12 year uh, mm -hmm. life expectancy uh, difference between the wealthiest and the poorest of our societies in this part of the world. Uh, incredible. And, and the related uh, call for investment and enabling policies uh, reminding us that uh, uh, social security is indeed an enabling uh, right and uh, this is very, very important uh, indeed. Mm. And uh, briefing us on how you see the way forward in terms of identifying the, the most food insecure group, the, the reason why they are food insecure, and then develop sets of policies that indeed are, uh, are addressing those challenges. So thank you very much for that. We have very little time uh, because we are reaching already uh, the top of the hour. And uh, this room, is busy with another group at 11. So if there is one question perhaps in the room, we can take it and please tell us to whom it is addressed so that we can be uh, specific. So, sir, please, could you tell us? Yes, Christophe Goulet from the Geneva Academy. Okay. It's, uh, it's more a compliment. Uh, we didn't really talk about the right food in Europe. Um, the, as you may know that uh, because of the COVID crisis, there is increase in food insecurity in Europe. Um, and for the first time, we realized that Having the right to learn, the right to work, and the right to social security is not enough. We have seen that in, in Geneva. That's why we recognized the right to the constitution last year. And um, now there are a few new developments. On the 3rd of October, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe asked all the member states of the Council of Europe to recognize the right to food in the constitution and to adopt the framework mm -hmm. on the right to food. Also, uh, next week at the CFS, there will be a side event during which the European Citizen Initiative will be launched by uh, so the civil society. Um, um, yeah, so there was a lot of momentum and Michael by, fact, Michael Winfrey said, you know, they asked for food insecurity figures. It was the same in France. The committee made a recommendation. Can you tell us who are food insecure? How many people? They don't know. So the question was, uh, for the next report, you have to notify these people. And to, so this, this question is also, the SDGs are also, we said, for the North. So these questions are also uh, important for the, for, the, for the North. And the response is one, is the right to food also for them in many of these cases. OK, thank you very much. And please. Thank you. I'm Green Kim from the OECHL. And then I'm, I'm focusing on the right to work and right to social security. And thank you very much for this. Uh, I mean, the very important discussions. And then and then also the, the, the presentations by uh, many speakers. I just want to highlight one point here, the importance of the human rights framework to the right to food and right to social security. Because this morning, I was so encouraged to hear uh, many people talking about the, uh, the constitutional rights to social security and the constitutional right to, uh, to food. And then we see clearly uh, the importance and impact of uh, the recognition of these rights in the constitution through the examples in South Africa. And I, and I hope uh, that uh, Switzerland will be the next example to show uh, how this legal framework can have an actual impact on the realization of ESCRs. Because someone, I think it's uh, Anna Maria mentioned about the, the roles and the responsibilities of the corporation because uh, they took up some of the obligations from the states, uh, but they're not accountable. But actually, they are accountable within the human rights framework. Because, I mean, the, through the international human rights laws and at the same time, the, uh, the, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So through these international human rights, uh, the instruments that everybody has the responsibilities and obligations. Nobody can get away from their responsibilities and obligations under the international law. And then, and I think it is extremely important to identify the obligations of each one of us who are involved in the 
for the system and the social security systems so that uh, so that the, know the obligations under the human rights law and also uh, holding them accountable if there is any problems and if the rights are not uh, 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 realized or implemented, even abused. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for this uh, additional uh, information. So uh, I think now it's time to, uh, to close the event today and really sorry to, to cut the discussion part short because it's really an important topic and I hope we will have other opportunities. I, I think we see a, a lot of uh, passion in the room and in the virtual room. Uh, so I think we need to have a more of dialogue and I'm sure colleagues from uh, Lawrence Division will, will agree to work and I'm sure working with OHCHR colleagues will be able to do that. So I'd like to, to say a big thank to, uh, of course, all of you keynote speakers, panelists, co-sponsor of, uh, of, of Brazil, um, and of course the audience for your participation. I'd like to remind you that uh, next week in Rome, the Committee on World Food Security uh, will be holding its 52nd session, and there will be a global thematic event to realize 20 years since the adoption of the Right to Food uh, Guidelines. So this is indeed uh, very uh, important. Um, as we uh, recognize 20 years since the, the adoption of the Right to Food Guidelines, uh, FAO will be uh, re-releasing uh, this month the Right to Food Guidelines themselves in digital format for uh, all to use. And uh, of course, uh, when it comes to our office here in, uh, in Geneva, we, uh, we work hand in hand with the dedicated right to food teams and social protection team in the rural transformation and, and gender equality division in Rome uh, to ensure that right-based approach further enhance FAO work and mandate, leading to enhanced food security and nutrition uh, for all leaving no one behind. So again, uh, thank you. Big thank to our OHCHR uh, colleagues and all uh, discussants in the room today and uh, have a good rest of the Day and please help us promote uh, the theme of the tomorrow uh, World Food Day, uh, which is uh, right to put. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.